Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Al Messner, and uh, I uh, taught at Oakville High School for 35 years. And uh, uh, when I was teaching for a couple of years, there was a lady from Oakfield named Irma Wallace who was the history buff at Oakfield. You know, every small town's got one of those people and she wrote all kinds of history about Oakfield. So she told me one day, uh, you go out and take some pictures of the brickyards. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have these. And uh, after you have the pictures, then you gotta start finding out what really happened there. So uh, eventually put this together from slides into a, a program, you know, where you have it on the computer. So, first of all, how many know where the Oakfield Brickyards is? There's a lot of people here that know where it is. It's right out of Oakfield, uh, going out towards Wapan on D. And, uh, of course, the big thing that you can recognize is the chimney, that most of it was there until a little while ago, and now it's half there. So uh, they started taking part of it down last year. Um, why is the brickyards located there? Because they had clay. They found clay on uh, William Beebe's farm. And I'm not sure about this, but I think maybe Beebe's farm was on the corner of uh, B and D, where you turn off and go into Oakfield there, because there was a mill pond there. So someplace they made brick before they made brick at the brickyards. Now, I call it the brickyards, but there was two main things that happened at the brickyards. One was making brick and tile. The other one was the lime kilns. And actually, uh, a lot of the reason the brickyards is there is because of the lime kilns. Okay, now, the, you might wonder, uh, we got a good clay here. Uh, how in the world can you get clay that was made from trilobites and uh, mud and uh, coral reef and that would have to occur when it's warm. You know, we wouldn't have coral growing here now in Lake Winnebago, would we? I don't think so. And so uh, at one time there was a warm tropical ocean reef near the equator and uh, due to the continental drift uh, that equator line came pretty close to the Oakville Brickyards. Uh, if you take a look at this picture here, uh, right here there's a continental arch, and this area where Oakville Brickyards is located, it was a warm uh, tropical ocean. And this line that goes along here was probably the equator at that time when the shale was formed. So right here was a shallow ocean, coral reef, and you can see we were just south of the equator due to plate tectonics and all of these pieces of the earth moving around. So uh, they, they can determine pretty carefully today where the equators were located at different times. The next big thing that happened that is actually affected our landscape was the glaciers that came through. This picture is a geologic map of Wisconsin, and you can see there's a lot of difference between the western half of the state and the eastern half of the state. Now, in the western half of the state, it was not glaciated, a lot of it. The eastern half was, <coughs> And the areas we're talking about here, uh, right here, the purple is Makokota Shale that we made brick out of. And the, the uh, bluer gray area right in here, that's Niagara Dolomite. We make limestone out of All of our quarries that are around in the area are mining Niagara Dolomite. When the glaciers came through, uh, they basically, in our area, called, uh, carved out two areas. Uh, there, first of all, was the Green Bay Lobe that came down here, and that actually carved out Lake Winnebago and the Horkin Marsh. And then on this side, 
was the Lake Michigan lobe, which carved out Lake Michigan. And <coughs> why do we have the thumb there? Uh, because that limestone or that stone was harder than a lot of the other stone. And so part of the glacier went this way, the glacier was much as a mile thick. And the other part of it is that uh, the glacier slid over the top in some area, slid over the top of the limestone. Now you can take a look at afterwards if you haven't seen this. I have this piece here that has glacial striations on it. The striations, that, that piece actually came from the Valders quarry. And in Valders there was two glaciers. One went one way and earlier and then another one went the other way. So they're almost at right angles there. Uh, the glaciers that came through here all went south, right this way. <coughs> now there's also something else that you notice here. There's a continental arch. This goes all the way across and it's hard stone that comes across here and it actually comes out over here at uh, Niagara Falls. Now, if you look down at the bottom here, this limestone that we mine for lime, uh, for a stone, goes all the way under Lake Michigan and then it comes out back again. It starts uh, here, comes out, comes out over here, uh, it comes out at the uh, Niagara Falls the Niagara Falls region. <coughs> this slide shows uh, the different areas where you have glacial deposits which are called end moraines. So you can kind of take a look here and see uh, one glacier stopped here, another one went down here. There's actually some that went down into northern Illinois. Uh, these were maybe in about 20,000 years ago, and if you look in our area right here, here's the last glacier that came through, and that came through in about uh, 10,000 years ago. And actually, that glacier got way over here, and I don't know if you've heard about the uh, buried forest over along Lake Michigan. If you walk along Lake Michigan, uh, somewhere uh, near the two... Uh, well, there's actually only one now, the nuclear power plants by you know, uh, two creeks. You can see sticks coming out of the uh, side of the river, or of the uh, bank there. And uh, those sticks were from the buried forest about 10,000 years ago. I've got a little piece laying up here. I used to have a nice big piece, but I taught school for 35 years, and when kids final stuff, you know, it disappears and it gets broken and so I've got a couple of little sticks left. i got to get over there and get a bigger piece. This is a cross section of Fond du Lac County and uh, in the cross section here you can see uh, Lake Winnebago here. Uh, you can see the Makokota Shale. On top of that is the Niagara Dolomite, and uh, shale and dolomite go all the way under uh, Lake Michigan. At one time, that shale and Niagara Dolomite covered the entire state of Wisconsin. But over periods of years, it's been eroded back to the position where it is right now. If you go down further, you can find different uh, groups of, uh, a lot of people have their wells into this St. Peter sandstone here, deeper wells. Uh, of course, uh, everybody probably uh, from around here is familiar with Breakneck Hill. Uh, that's in our town. I'm on the town board. Uh, it, it's uh, something that we, we finally had to put a sign up here that you can't have large trailers and 20-foot uh, wide combines go up here. Uh, they did. So uh, it, it, it's a neat little area. And I've got a picture from years ago when it was a mud road. Uh, at this time, probably about the time when this picture was taken, they were building Wapon State Prison. Wapon State Prison is built out of Niagara Dolomite from uh, the Oakville Ledge. At the same time they built that, they built Stone School, which is at the corner of Highway B and Breakneck Road, where I went to a one-room school. And my father went to the same school. 
and it's still uh, standing there. It's turned into a house, but uh, when they built that school, they must have done a good job in the early 1900s because it wasn't like a lot of one-room schools. It had a, a tall basement, it had bathrooms, they had a well, and they had electricity. And uh, that was a lot uh, better than a lot of uh, the one-room schools that were in areas years ago. This is a couple of kids that were on a field trip that we took one time. This is a ledge. There's lots of petroglyphs up here on the ledge. There is uh, caves. Uh, of course, uh, when I was small, we would find caves and go for a hike. Uh, the next picture that I took here <coughs> is very interesting because you see all the cracks in the limestone there? It's just totally cracked. That cracking is called karst topography, and uh, you're going to hear an awful lot more about this because anything that's on top of the ledge from here over to Lake Michigan underneath has karst topography. Now if you dump uh, water on top of here, like rain, or you dump manure on there, where's it going to go? Right down. They can dump dyes on something, and within less than one day, it'll be in somebody's well. So it, it's, uh, it's karst topography, and it does not lend itself well to having uh, like manure spread on a lot of these areas. Okay, back to the uh, quarry here. The actual quarry uh, consists of the, uh, if you take a look at this here, that's the shale. When I took this picture, they had just cleared off this overburden and pushed it over here. Actually, I think today they probably wouldn't be able to do that because it kind of went right into a creek that used to go along there. But uh, this is the shale we're talking about that they used for uh, making the brick. Okay, the brickyards uh, is just a kind of a map of what it looks like. There was the actual pit area, the industrial area. There's a house that's still sitting there right along D. Uh, this is the actual Niagara ledge. Uh, right on top of there, you can find glacial striations like I talked about. This was the old quarry where they quarried limestone out of. And there's a path that goes up to this quarry. Uh, take a look at that. That's the uh, path that used to go up to the quarry uh, where they first started with limestone, going up that path right up here. Uh, right now it hasn't been used for a number of years and it's pretty well overgrown. Like I said, there's really two things that happened at the brickyards there. And the first actual thing in about 1900s or early 1900s, a company from over by Valders, the Standard Lime and Stone Company, uh, bought this land here Whoop, I want too many. I think I can. I, am I going backwards? Yes, good. Um, they bought the land from Darling. This area was called Darling's Gap. And if you take a look here, that's Highway D, that's old Highway D that came out of Oakfield and went to Wapon. This house is, is still standing as some of these other buildings here. But this was the operation of the actual lime kilts. These two stacks here, uh, where they would, they would mine and quarry limestone on the top. They had an intricate system of way from back over here, they would cart the limestone and just dump it in the top there, and underneath they'd fire it. And uh, they used this limestone after it was fired for uh, quick lime, which most of the buildings around here, the old farmhouses, they used it as cement. Uh, if you had a farm, it, you usually had to have your farm whitewashed. That was made of this stuff, uh, quick lime. And it also was used for putting on land to control the pH if you had too acid of a soil. 
But this company, the Standard Lime and Stone Company, bought this from Darling in early 1900s, about 1904, and the reason they did this is they brought a line in here. You can kind of see when you drive by there, there's a brush that grows up over to the bike trail. That's now a snowmobile and bike trail. And the Chicago Northwestern Railroad uh, owned this line. And they had outlets that were different from Valders because Valders went south towards Milwaukee and Chicago. And if they could get a stone operation here, this would go over at, to uh, the west further. Some uh, different outlets that they had for selling their uh, quick line. This was the original brickyards. Uh, at this time, there was a lot of name changes here. Uh, it was called Badger Press Brick Company in 1900 and they had one kiln at the time. Uh, and their operation was right in this building here. They had individual uh, chimneys for each one of the uh, kilns. They only had one at this time. And uh, they had a fire here. This, this whole complex burned down. This was a field trip that was taken up on top of the ledge one time. And so you can see all of the store uh, quarrying that was done. Uh, that they hauled limestone out of here to make that quick line. Uh, there's also petroglyphs up here. And that one time we were up there was somebody that knew more about those than I did, and they showed us uh, a shape of a turtle that they had made. Uh, the reason that this was kind of important to the Indians was that from here they could see over towards uh, the east, and they could also see over towards the west, uh, lots of distances. Coincidence with that last picture was 20 years ago today. That was? Were you there? <laughs> no, I just read it on the bottom. Oh, on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years ago today. Uh, what are the odds? What are the odds? <laughs> 20 years ago. I was there. No, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for pointing that out. I would have never noticed that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is what's left. You can go there, and there's more brush there now, but the bottom of those, uh, the limestone kiln is right here. Uh, those two big metal chimneys were up above this, and uh, they fired it from the bottom here shovel coal in here and got it hot and when they got it hot enough it would turn to calcium oxide and then they would uh, combine it with water so it would make quick line. That's another picture of uh, what they looked like. But these had to be fired just like the lime kiln, uh, the, like the brickyards. Now the actual brick making operation, uh, when I took the pictures that uh, we're following here, uh, this is kind of a diagram of what it looked like. The, uh, the industrial plant where they actually made the brick right here. This is the old chimney that's partly there yet. The fan house, you'll see some pictures of that. There were four kilns, three here, one that's a little bit hidden. These two had individual chimneys, four individual chimneys. The two on the bottom were hooked to this fan house. And they had a big fan in there and they would suck air through these two kilns and they could fire that one a lot hotter and it would, uh, they could fire it quicker. Then you see all these little railroad tracks here. Well, the tracks, back up. These two buttons are close together for my big thumb. Um, the tracks are right here. You can take the brick out of here. You, you can go back into the drying chambers here. And you can back go back here for storage. Or you can load any one of these kilns. So they're little push tracks. You'll see that it's not any real mechanized operation. Uh, this is what the brickyard looked like. This is one of the first two kilns here, the, the one that was farthest towards the west. 
uh, the office, the fan house, the tall chimney, the actual plant where they made brick, the pulverizer was located just inside of this door. They would grind the shale up, blow it up this stack, come down into the mixer where they would mix the brick. You can see this little door over here. That's a door that goes into their drying ovens. This is the office of the Oakfield Shale Brick and Tile Company. All my life, I've known it as Oakfield Shale Brick and Tile Company. And yes, they made tile. Uh, they, uh, the bricks are over here, and here's one of the tile they made. And if you're doing any tiling in the area where it was uh, tiled many years ago, that's what you're going to run into, red clay tile. We have them all over our farm. This was the last owner of uh, the brickyards, Dale Wood. He's relation to Ralph Hartley, who owned it before. They, the uh, Hartleys owned it for quite a few years. Uh, Dale Wood was the owner when I took the pictures. This is his neat, tidy little office. And uh, every time I do this talk, I learn something, and somebody usually gives me something. And this morning, a fellow that uh, worked for uh, the person that bought it after they sold the brickyards, uh, they went in the office and uh, he gave me a whole packet of bills and invoices and letters that were from the brickyards, and I haven't looked at them yet, except that just pulled one out, I didn't have time, but they were probably at the bottom of this pile. <laughs> This was a picture that appeared in 1964 in the uh, Fond du Lac Reporter. Um, the one on the left is the same fellow that was in the picture there, uh, Dale Wood. And the uh, person on the right was Paul Redman. Paul Redman was the one that was the operator, the true operator of the brickyards. Uh, he would have to uh, make sure everything was going properly, probably take over and fire it at night. And, uh, Quite a person. He lived in the house that is still standing there, right next to the brickyards. And I didn't say this, I can probably show you afterwards, but uh, before Highway D was reconstructed, they used to have a whole row of houses right across from the brickyards where the workers would live. And at one time they had as many as 40 workers that worked there year-round because the Oakfield Brickyards was probably the only brickyards in the state of Wisconsin that operated all 12 months out of the year. Uh, this is a picture of what, that would look, what it looked like uh, one winter when I stopped there and took some pictures. This is what the shale looks like. Now the shale is actually pretty hard, so they would dynamite it to uh, pulverize it some so that you could actually load this up with a loader. I don't know who that guy is there, if it has any resemblance to me or not, but that's when I first started teaching. <laughs> From that point, they would haul the shale uh, through this driveway up here, go around here and come in, and right here they would dump it in here. You can see the tall chimney, the other small chimneys there, and the rest of the, the drying ovens are uh, right here. So, take a look at inside the factory. This is the dumping uh, place for the shale at the bottom. is a conveyor or elevator had a rubber uh, or leather belt that the clay would run into the grinder. And of course, uh, here's somebody hard at work. Everything, almost everything on this operation was done by hand. Um, just shovel the, the shale into that conveyor and it would go down here and into, there's the motor that operator, operates the pulverizer. Uh, now I'm downstairs, and I'm taking a look at this. Uh, this is the actual mill right here, this operation. Uh, the motor is up here, 
and they would actually, once it's ground up into a fine powder, they would uh, blow it up this pipe and then it would come out down into the actual operation where they made the brick. So it would come up from upstairs, come down this chute, and go into the mixer on the bottom here. Uh, you see these two valves here? Water. So it's just like a cement mixer. You had to add water. Now again, there's nothing magic about this. When you needed water, you turned the valve. When there was enough, you turned it off. And then if you got too much, you had to, you know, you know this operation when you're making cement by hand. Uh, this is a picture of the augers, the mixer, that would mix the water and the shale. I don't know if they did one batch at a time. I guess they would probably do a kind of a batch at a time. I'm not sure it was an operation when I was doing it. This is not the color. This was a picture taken just with sunlight coming in. Uh, this is a true color of the actual uh, shale. And you can see the, um, the thing stuff being mixed here. Uh, there, I did find an analysis of Makokata shale. It's kind of interesting to look at this because uh, the top one there is silicon oxide, that's uh, sand. It's got some aluminum in it, of course water. Uh, go down the line, there's calcium, magnesium, other stuff in there. But all of the Oakville brick, the natural color was red. How come? Which one? Iron. 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 Down there, iron oxide, right, right in the middle there. Uh, uh, that's what gives Oakfield brick its color. And uh, all the brick, unless they colored it with something, was red. And you can take a look at the end ones there. And uh, the brick that comes out of the, the shale before it's fired looks like this, just like the shale itself. Now, uh, the last time I gave this at the school, uh, somebody came up and told me about an old house in Oakfield, when you go out on Oakfield on Y, and it's a hit house, and I said, uh, they said, oh, that was made out of Oakfield brick, and I said, no, it's not. Uh, I know it's not, because the cream, the color of the brick is cream colored. Does anybody know where cream colored brick came from? Milwaukee, Cream City, Milwaukee. Milwaukee brick is cream colored because of the different materials that obviously they don't have any iron in that particular kind of shale. This is inside of the uh, manufacturing place where they're making brick. They're coming out of that, uh, I got some more pictures here, but you see that they're taking the brick off of the conveyor. There's a, a little belt here that comes along where the brick are on and then they stack them by hand onto two carts on the railroad tracks here that get pushed in and pushed out. This right here is called the pug mill. Uh, the, uh, after the clay is mixed with water, it comes into this machine and it pushes the brick out like a Sausage, sausage stuffer. And if you look down the line here, that's one long tube of brick coming out of there. They're not cut yet. This is just all one long line. Uh, this device here is the embosser, and that's the cutter. I'll, I'll talk to you more about that in just a minute. This is the actual pug mill, where the, it's the extruder part of it, where the brick are coming out. Uh, you notice a couple of things here if I point this out. First of all, if you look carefully, you can see a hole there. So they had tubes where the brick would come out and it would put holes in them. So if you look at some of these brick here, most of them have holes in. Uh, they put them in so that when you were building a house, you know, the mortar would go down the hole and the brick wouldn't move back and forth. So. Almost all the brick have holes in, unless you're just using them for decoration or something like that. Then you also notice here we got these little wires that are sticking out of here that look like nails. Now, if you buy brick, you could buy smooth brick. 
like uh, this side here, smooth brick, or you could buy face brick. So if you wanted that decoration on the side of the brick, all you'd have to do is, uh, of course, again, by hand, move these little wires down and it would do the, the edge of the brick and then these wires here would do the other side if you wanted two sides faced. Then uh, we're getting into more on the line here because here's the embosser. If you wanted a name on the brick, this would be put down and it would roll on top of the brick and put a name on. Uh, this is the cutter. When I saw this thing in operation, I was just totally amazed because this thing had been designed by somebody and it is just truly unique. And I, like I said, I took these pictures in the early 60s and this place had been in operation for a lot of years already. So somebody ingeniously devised this machine. And what it had was four sets of wires here and uh, gears that would turn it. And as that thing, as the brick were coming out, they continued to go down this uh, conveyor and that cutter would follow them at the same speed and it would turn a quarter of a turn and slice the brick off, exactly the size of a brick. And then here we have the embosser and this, you can see that this is uh, after the brick have been cut. Uh, there are individual bricks here coming out now and uh, as that machine got down to the end and it got all of that, about 20 brick at a time, cut, it would quick move back and get a line to take the next 20 brick. And I thought, well, that's really ingenious. And it had to move at the exact same speed as the conveyor was. So I, I was impressed by that machine. Somebody did a good job of designing that. Once the brick came out, they were stacked by hand, as you saw before, onto these carts. Uh, again, certain ways they stack these bricks. And uh, after they are stacked in here, they would head to the drying ovens. The drying ovens were uh, long chambers. You can see underneath here the tracks that they would roll these carts on, push these in, push a number of carts in here at a time. The heat source was underneath here. You can see the grates where the heat could come out. And they'd fill this up, and they'd have to dry the brick before they were fired. So the bricks that I have here, like this one here, has already been dried, uh, but not fired. Underneath the drying ovens were two, uh, th th these burned uh, fuel oil two oil burners, and uh, they went underneath each one. And I was there, Paul was there with me and showed me how they worked. And uh, all they had on them to control the temperature was a valve, and if the temperature wasn't hot enough, he'd open the valve, get more heat out of that. And he determined he didn't have a thermometer underneath in front, uh, just in back of the burners, they had some brick in there. When they got hot, they would turn a color. And so he would watch the color of those brick to see if he had enough heat or not. And then uh, if not, well, you open the valve and get more oil going in. After the brick were dried, they were rolled out of the drying ovens on this ingenious little uh, set of railroad tracks. And you can see uh, here, they're coming out of the drying oven. They come down here to a little roundabout where they can change their position and they could go back to those two uh, kilns that were in the back there or they could come around here and fill the ones in the front, pushed all by hand. So, here's the four kilns that I mentioned before. Uh, of course, beside every kiln is a pile of coal, 
You see the holes in all of these where they had to be fired with coal. Uh, one of the uh, four, for some reason, had a metal coating on it. I, I don't know why, but maybe it kept the heat in better. That's the one that's in the picture here, and there, there you can see the four individual chimneys that were on this particular kiln. Uh, picture that I took in the wintertime one time, uh, obviously not being fired because there sure wouldn't be any snow on top. And I didn't have a picture of uh, somebody firing this, so I talked uh, our other science teacher, Mr. Greenhouse, <coughs> into uh, posing for a picture, and he looks like he would fit right in with one of the workers there. <laughs> so we, uh, we uh, just took that, and you can see that there's no firing happening here, and what you see off to the left uh, in this position here is a fan that's actually cooling the brick after they have been fired. Now, one of the times that I gave this talk, uh, a lady came up to me, and uh, this is Shady, and she says, I have a picture of when those were being fired, and this is my hus husband, Herb Shady. Now, if you probably saw the article in the uh, Action Advertiser, that's the picture that's in the Action Advertiser. So uh, she gave me the picture for a while. I made a copy of it and sent it back to her, and uh, everything is fine and dandy until it got into the action advertiser here a couple weeks ago or a week ago. And so I have uh, going. We were at the coffee hour one morning, and somebody comes down and tells me that's not Herb Shady. Nice. <laughs> 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 nope. That is not Herb Shady. Herb Shady never fired the, the kilns. Well, who is it? Well, that's Rudy Redman. And who says it's Rudy Redman? His wife. I can verify that's my dad. Herb? Yep. That's Herb Shady. So I started showing the picture here to other people, and I know it's running at least 10 to 1 uh, voting, but it's Herb Shady. I'm pretty sure it's Herb Shady. Now I have verification, yes. So I'm not sure why she thought it was her husband. This is another thing that amazed me. To get the brick in and out, they had doors. Now, one would think that you would have a door that you could uh, close and open. But I suppose that wasn't very energy efficient, you know, to hold the heat in. So, uh, once they got the brick all in here, guess what they did? They bricked up the door. Uh, just, it's just mind-boggling, you know, when you look at all the hand labor that was involved in here. And, of course, here's the cart. It, takes the brick in and out. I took a picture of this afterwards. Uh, this was later because one of the kilns was just falling apart in disarray, but because of that, I could sh see all of the air chambers that would be underneath the, uh, uh, the kiln. And you can see how the hot air would come out of these little holes where the bricks were put on, and these were the air chambers underneath there. So it was kind of interesting to see that. And another picture of the air chambers that ran from one end of the kilns to another. And this one amazed me. This is a brick, of course, that had already been fired. Now you can see the color. They got their true color, the red color. And wow, I looked at the ceiling here. And from all of the firings that had taken place over the years, uh, the ceiling is glazed, just like you do in ceramics class, you know, or pottery. And I don't know what the material is in these bricks that cause the glazing, but it was really neat to see that when I took that picture. Once the brick are fired, the temperature in the kilns was 2,000 to 2,400 degrees. The amount of time it took 
depended on the temperature outside, how cold it was. The, the kilns that had the large chimney could be fired hotter, quicker, so it would take less time. Uh, but I don't know, I think the whole operation would probably take about a week. And then once they're fired, uh, they had fans that would go, they'd take, open the doors and put the fans in there. And it would take quite a while to cool a set of bricks down. And again, you can see the intricate way they uh, store it, stashed all these brick in there. All, everyone down in by hand, just, just a certain way. Another fan, this one's in one of the other kilns was working. Uh, this is two people that are uh, unloading the brick. I forgot the guy's name. I can look it up afterwards. I have it somewhere, but uh, I, I did finally figure out somebody knew who that was. I'll try to find it afterwards. Um, but they loaded them on by hand. Once they got out of here, they wheel them out, they would put them on a truck to be hauled. And I know that I talked to somebody back there, Zimmerman, where the Zimmermans did the trucking. And, or they put them on earlier on a railroad car, if there was still a railroad in operation, or they'd be stored for a while in one of their storage sheds. <coughs> Uh, there's one kiln left out there. It looks like this. Actually, it's probably even in worse shape now. I haven't been out there for a few years to take the picture, but uh, the rest of them just fell down. Uh, age does that to everything. This was the inside of that one that was left. Uh, just, just falls apart. Uh, here's one of the reasons why the Oakfield Shale Brick and Tile Company had to go out of business, because they're located, of course, right next to Oakfield, and after a little while there were houses built on top of here and along the road, and they really had no place to expand. They did try digging across the road, but for some reason that shale wasn't very good, and I don't think the village would have probably gone along with another big hole right across the road. But in the 60s when I took these pictures, and uh, it wasn't until the 80s when they really closed down, but you could see that things weren't going too well because <coughs> this was a furnace for their heat source in the factory. Uh, the roof was in total disrepair. This is the truck that they hauled all the shale up there with, so they go down and they did have a loader and tractor and they loaded it on the truck and brought it up there, but boy, uh, that's uh, kind of an old truck in poor shape. Uh, this is a picture of what the chimney looked like. Um, it was, uh, I think, 120 feet tall. And you can already see in the 60s, there's problems at the top of the chimney, but it was really well constructed because uh, it had very few cracks down the side. Just the top was deteriorating. Uh, this is a picture when the brickyards was being fired. Those, either one of the two kilns or both were being fired. And so you can see the smoke coming out of the chimneys there. Uh, this is a picture of what the, it looked like here a couple years ago. This is the fan house. Uh, this is a chimney that's uh, still there. Uh, better picture of the fan house. Actually, that's not in too bad a shape. The windows are on doors are gone. Um, the fellow that owns this now, he's actually going to repair this building and use it. The old, uh, uh, this is actually the manufacturing facility and that was made of block and it's just, it's just falling apart. Uh, but I got inside of this fan house and I thought this was kind of amazing because they had a big uh, uh, area underneath a tunnel and you can see here the fan that was used, and this was down here in the tunnel, and it would suck air out of those uh, chimneys, 
out of the uh, two kilns and force it up this chimney here. Now, it's just like a blacksmith shop. If you can get more air moving through here, you're going to get a hotter fire. And so it will work fine. These two kilns really work good, and uh, they would choose to use these kilns uh, rather than the other two. Just another picture of the tunnel that leads into the chimney. And of course, for uh, getting the clay loose, the clay is pretty hard. Uh, if you've ever uh, tried to uh, do uh, clay, I remember uh, when we built a silo one time on our farm, we were down in the clay and we had to pick it loose, and it's <coughs> tight, and it's hard. And so to get it loose, the first thing they would do was use uh, dynamite to blast it through. And of course, you had a place, had to have a place to store the dynamite. And this was a little shed. I think it's still there. It was before when I took these pictures. Uh, they had two storage sheds. Uh, the one on the left, they're still there. The one on the left is being used by a contractor uh, in his business. The one on the right is a car repair shop. The water supply for the brickyards came from the little creek that's right aside of it. They had a little building there. Actually, this was a new one that was constructed. They had a pump in here that would pump the water up to the brickyards. Uh, on that pipe so they would mix it with the clay. Paul Redmond's house, which still sits there, it's in disrepair too, he didn't have that luxury. He had to walk down here and haul all his water from the creek. They had no running water in the house. The final brick was made February 1st, 1983. Uh, it was you know, right away, Oakville is a small community. Uh, everybody knows what's going on with everybody else. And I heard that, oh, this was the final firing. And so I stopped in there and I picked up a couple of bricks. Those two on the end there are from the last firing. Of course, one's broke, it's dropped. Somebody dropped it. But it was February 1st, 1983. Uh, this is a picture of uh, another picture I took when the kiln was fired. Boy, you knew it. Uh, there's just a lot of black smoke coming out of there. Now, if you happen to be with your house uh, back in here someplace, or if the wind was in a different direction, and they were firing the brickyards, you made absolute certain that you didn't hang your washout <laughs> on the line on these days, because it would not be a good situation. Uh, all of a sudden, last year it came by one day, oh my goodness, look what's happening. Uh, they're taking the uh, chimney down. So I stopped in and talked to the owner, and he said, well, uh, yep, he's going to take it down, but he's going to save that building on the bottom there. So they got this huge, this thing had to reach up there 100 and some feet. And they, they were working like crazy. They were taking that thing down. When it got down further, then... Uh, he had a, a, his own uh, cherry picker that he could use. And another picture of them working up there. And then he continued to take it down, but I think he changed his mind. And I haven't talked to him lately, but he's got a nice uh, uh, flat surface on the top. And it looks like it's in pretty good shape. So I think he's probably going to leave the rest of the chimney there. And this building down below here, the thing. Fan house. I noticed just a, lately he's taken the roof off of there and he must be going to put a new roof on there. That's it. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Yes. Just going back on some of your slides when you said the, uh, where they, the carts go up into that one ramp. That's where they go in to load them, okay? And they had about 15 or 18 carts on the inside. Yep. Then they would go into the heat. Then they had like four tracks on the back side of that where they stored the dried brick after the heating. Then they would come down. Then they would come down the there. Yep. Uh, yep, when I was there and took the pictures, I know they had storage in the back there, but uh, they were just 
at that time they were just bringing them out and they were taking them right over to a kiln on that day. <coughs> Any other questions, comments? Was the, was the iron oxide that made them red, was that added? No. Um, the majority of Oakfield brick, if you look <coughs> at the buildings like Oakfield High School, um, that, uh, that's the color of the brick and uh, it was in there naturally. The iron is in there naturally and it gives them the red color. So unless they wanted some other color, I just pulled a, one of these slips open that he gave me and somebody wanted green brick. Now, I, I don't know if they actually made any green. Everything I saw that they ever made there was that color on the end. But I know they couldn't put color into it. When I saw the recipe and they had the percentages of all of the different it's, it's not much, but a little bit of it. <coughs> yeah, a little bit of it makes... Maybe that was a recipe of things that were going in, or... Yeah. And the tile, same thing. Uh, they're all red, like that. The tile that are around there. Now, there is one other interesting thing that happens here. Uh, Oakville High School, when I was teaching there, we were short of space, so we needed a new physics room, and we put a room on, and they made them out of uh, Oakville brick which was like Oakville High School is made out of. But as the years progressed, we noticed cracks in the wall. And then we got somebody in there, an engineer, to take a look at it. And uh, what happened was the wall kept moving up. And the block on the inside stayed there. But the brick on the outside kept moving up. And we tried to figure out why, is it the foundation or what? And finally somebody that knew a lot about making brick said it wasn't fired hot enough porous. as porous. And the brick take on water and over the years they expanded. And the ceiling on top was actually six inches above the top of the block. <laughs> and so for uh, one half a year, uh, and until they decided they really had to take that part down. Uh, we were warned that if there was a wind over 30 miles an hour, we could not be in that room. <laughs> <laughs> because the roof is sitting on nothing. It's just not attached to anything. I noticed that with these tile, because uh, drained from our old house, uh, when I built ours 50 years ago, that's the tile they had. And those tile are so tight in between, because usually you have these tile and the water runs in between them. Those tile are so tight that even a tree root can't get in there. They're, they're wedged in tight. You can't get one out unless you break it. So, you know the real reason they went out of business. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, standard line, how long were you in business there? Uh, see, that's, I think, the same, uh, over the years, it's still uh, over there at Valders and a couple of other places. I think they're, they're still in business there. over there. Because they were actually in Nasbro also. Uh, there, I think uh, that's uh, the name of the Nasbro company, and the fella that you... <laughs> Nas Brothers was Nasbro. A standard line, they had, there was actually two sets of kills there. Okay. On the north was standard line, yeah. and on the south was Nas, Nas Brothers. The, the Nas Brothers, uh, the, one, the one fella, uh, I think is a son now, uh, he just opened the quarry up on top of the ledge. That's called uh, oh gosh, Niagara, Niagara Stone. That's what his name is, quarry. Built a nice new building and he's got a nice facility there and he's operating that quarry that Lefebvre used to operate. Oh, okay. Yep. Built a nice, nice building, got new equipment. I think he's going to do well. Yeah, you. <laughs> Sorry. Back in the 70s, I think it was, somebody told me that Oakfield Brew Clay was the most desirable clay for tournament horseshoe courts and they were they were trying to, they had ordered it out from all across the country. So it's the natural you looked kind of bluish before it was fired. Yep. But, uh, is, is that a true story? True story, right? I think some uh, Mr. Zimmerman told me that back there that uh, people were coming in from all over to get clay for their horseshoe pits. Yep. Yep. They liked it. 
Anything else? Yes. Where did most of the Oakville brick get sold to? I mean, what part? Milwaukee? Uh, I, well, of course, right in the area, but I think otherwise Milwaukee. Well, where did they haul to? We haul all over. They get like the uh, Leach Company up in Oshkosh that built Leach trucks. That's one of their buildings there. I hauled into uh, over around Collins uh, and then down in Milwaukee. We have the franchise for the state of Wisconsin and then the uh, northern part of Illinois. And a lot of it got hauled in uh, yards down into Milwaukee and sold out of the Milwaukee yards. Out of the Milwaukee yards. Good. I learned something again. <laughs> well, it actually got worse because uh, when the after it closed down, then the person that purchased it uh, dumped a lot, a lot of stuff got dumped in there illegally. And uh, it, the creek is right there and it might still be a problem because now there's lots of cars there. I don't like that either, but um, the DNR was going to take that over. And they did take over part of it up on top. The DNR owns all the land up on top, and that was a good move. But they would not take the pit quarry because there's uh, hazardous waste dumped in there. And so, actually, it's uh, there, there's a group that kind of uh, oversees that land, and part of it's in the town of Oakfield, and part is in the village. And right now, it's just there. So maybe some year it'll get cleaned up and you can do, I don't know what you can do with it, but it's a pit. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm Mary. Okay, this one here is a picture of a hired brick that has a smooth surface on the edge. Of course, you can see the holes in the middle. Uh, this one here is a picture of a face brick where they uh, just use little nails or uh, wires to put a line in there, so they look pretty nice. They look much nicer on a building. The holes are put in there so that you could uh, use them for mortar. When you put the mortar in between, the brick would hold still. This is a picture, a uh, specimen I should say, of a brick before it's been fired. After it's been in the drying table, you can See, it's uh, kind of like a clay thing on there. It'll come off. Uh, next picture I have, or specimen I have, I got to quit calling them pictures, is uh, glacial striations. Now, if we look on top of the ledge, I can get a piece of uh, thing. It's nice and smooth on the top. And this one here came from Valders because there was two glaciers, one that came about 12,000 years ago here, and then another one that came later about, uh, well, this one was 20,000 years ago, and this one here was more like 12. And a nice smooth surface where the glacier, about a mile thick, would press down on a rock that was hard and it would cause a groove in the top of the ledge. We have all kinds of this on top of at Breakneck Hill, but then when the glacier only went in one direction, so I kind of like this specimen. Uh, this one here is just a picture of a fossil impression in limestone. You can find these uh, pretty much all over on the ledge in uh, different kinds of limestone that's there. And this is a couple of pieces of wood, pine tree from the buried forest when the last glacier came through in Wisconsin 10,000 years ago. This is one of the tile that was made because it was called Oakfield Shale Brick and Tile Company and they made a lot of tile. And if you go out into a lot of fields, uh, older fields where you're doing digging or tiling, you will run into these clay tile. 